Good morning. Really cool to have you here. Happy Wednesday. Uh, jazz like that. Uh, this week in lab, all right, you will turn in the lab we did last week, the acid-based titrations lab. We'll also talk about problem set number five, which has got some thermodynamics and also some electrochemistry. We will do in lab the determination KSP delta G delta H and delta S for calcium hydroxide. Uh, it's another use of titration, which is kind of cool. But the quiz this week is actually going to be a take-home quiz. And Monday, next Monday, 529, early in the morning, I'll send you out a link to the quiz. And your goal is to print it out. And then Wednesday, a week from today, is when the quiz will be due. If you have a Wednesday afternoon lab, you'll turn it in in lab. But for the rest of you, then you must come to lecture next Wednesday. All right, we'll drop it in my box and stuff like that. Uh, it's due at nine o'clock. Um, so yeah, it should be pretty cool. Gives you a chance to kind of think about things. Questions on that? Okay, so we're in the world of electrochemistry. We're in the world of batteries. And when we have a battery that you put the anode and the cathode, the site of oxidation and the site of reduction together and current starts flowing, you create what's called an electrolytic cell. And that just means that it works. It's a battery that's functional, all right? And chemists uh, a long, for a long time ago have been able to hook up something called a voltmeter. And in physics, you'll talk about that more. But uh, when the battery works, the voltage that pops out is a positive number. And we'll talk more about what that means to you later on. So chemists would like to change anodes and cathodes, the sites of oxidation, sites of reduction. Uh, you know, it's always nice to have a battery that lasts a long time, but it would be, of course, nicer to have a battery that lasted twice as long. And so scientists in this field think about things like this, like how can we extend the life of batteries? And so sometimes they'll change anodes and cathodes and blah, blah, blah. By the way, anode and oxidation are both vowels. Reduction and cathode are both consonants, so that's one way to remember it. Um, I also had the red cat the other day, which is a way to remember that reduction and cathode go together. And ox was the best I could do for oxidation and oxidation. Uh, so anyway, in this example, we're looking at zinc, which is turning into zinc 2 plus and hydrogen ions turning into hydrogen gas. And they know this is happening because the amount of zinc metal is decreasing. As the zinc ions are made, you lose the mass of zinc. Also, the pressure of the hydrogen gas would be increasing because hydrogen gas is being created. So at the end on Monday, we talked about what's called the Xi electrode, standard hydrogen electrode. And that's the ruler stick for electrochemistry. Now in distance, all right, we have the meter stick, all right, and you can have centimeters, millimeters, four meters, you know, all, any kind of measurements can be made once everybody agrees what a meter is, okay? And in electrochemistry, this is the ruler stick. It's the Xi electro, and it's defined as exactly zero volts. Now, we're gonna see in a little bit that if you flip a reaction around, you will change the sign. But if it's zero volts and you flip it around, uh, it's still gonna be zero. So in this reaction, all right, zinc going to zinc two plus and the hydrogen ions going to hydrogen gas, they put it together and the voltmeter reads 0.76 volts. Well, if the Xi electrode is defined as zero, and this one plus the other one equals the total electrode, you can then easily find out what the missing piece is. So in this one, the total was 0.76, and that equals the uh, H plus plus the zinc. So the zinc by itself then, 0.76 minus zero, big surprise, 0.76 volts. So this is the way then that chemists figured out that the oxidation of zinc to zinc 2 plus has a positive 0.76 volts. 
And again, uh, it's a little weird, and yet it's so simple it's weird too at the same time. But because this is zero, and it can be oxidized or reduced, which it is right now, uh, it's zero volts, we can then define any other electrode based on it, all right? So John is working on a mercury electrode, we'll say, brand new. Uh, he doesn't know the number. If he would plug it in with the she, he could quickly find out then what its cell potential is, and we'll see that's pretty useful. Uh, any questions on she electrodes? People that do electrochemistry a lot like to think not in terms of just oxidation, but also in terms of reducing agents. Remember, reducing agent is oxidized, oxidizing agent is reducing. And I hate that, but I'm just the messenger here, so this is what we're dealing with. But anyway, because zinc is being oxidized, zinc is a better oxidate, it's better at being oxidized, or it's a better reducing agent than hydrogen, because hydrogen is not going to H+, plus. H+, plus is going to hydrogen. So zinc is better at being oxidized. We'll talk about more about why that's important here in a little bit. So if nothing else from the slide is honestly that meaningful, just know that A, she electrodes are the ruler stick of electrochemistry. And B, if you hook any other reaction up to she, you can record the overall voltage, and basically that overall voltage is the voltage that you're missing, which is pretty cool. Okay, let's look at another example. This is copper and copper two plus now going together. And when we hook this all up, it has a reading on the voltmeter of 0.34 volts, all right? Well, <clears throat> in this particular reaction, we don't see the hydrogen gas increasing. Actually, the pressure of the hydrogen gas decreases, and that means that hydrogen gas here is being turned into H+. So the hydrogen is being uh, oxidized. It's losing its electrons. It's the opposite of what we just saw. And on the other hand, uh, we saw the zinc metal going down. Well, here we see more and more copper metal being made. So copper wants those electrons uh, more than the copper wants to give up electrons. All right, and that's another thing. So because, again, she is zero, the she electrode, which is what this is, we can figure out what the cell potential is of the copper two plus going to copper. So. In this particular reaction, it's copper two plus going to copper metal and hydrogen gas going to hydrogen ions, all right? And the overall cell potential for the whole thing is 0.34 volts. So again, like last time, we can figure out that copper two plus going to copper metal is gonna have a value of 0.34 because the other one is zero, all right? Even though this is an oxidation instead of a reduction, it's still zero, all right? And we can figure out then that copper two plus wants electrons to make copper metal. Now, why that's kind of cool is that she electrode uses hydrogen gas and strong acid. So it's not the most friendly electrode to use of all time. So let's hook the zinc and the copper up now together, all right? And we saw that zinc likes to give up electrons to become zinc two plus. We also saw that copper two plus wants to take electrons and become copper. So if we combine these two together, we can actually predict what the cell potential should be when these two uh, come together. So zinc goes to zinc two plus. We saw it was positive 0.76 volts. We saw that copper two plus likes to take electrons to become copper, 0.34 volts. If you add these two reactions together, the electrons go away. Remember, chemists don't like to show electrons if they can help it. Overall cell potential, 1.10 volts. And that's what people see when they hook up their electrodes to this to make this kind of cell. So the zinc is being oxidized. The zinc is the anode. The copper two plus is gaining electrons. It's being reduced. Reduced and cathode go together. It's all coming together. All right. So here's an example of a reaction. You might want to know what the overall cell potential is. And in this reaction, we have nickel going to nickel two plus, and we have the mercury two two plus ion going to mercury liquid. 
And the question is, what's the overall cell potential? So in this kind of reaction, if you're given this, you want to make the half reactions look like the overall reaction. And you can see that, yeah, nickel is a reactant and nickel 2 plus is a product. Remember, your charges are critical in this section. Don't be slimping on the, on the charges. You've got to put them in. On the other hand, mercury 2, 2 plus is a reactant. Mercury liquid is a product. So if we literally add these two cell potentials together, the two electrons that are products will cancel the two electrons that are reactants right there. The overall cell potential just comes from adding these together, 1.04 volts. So again, we're back to adding two reactions to make them look like a third reaction. And in this case, the name of the game is just don't show the electrons. And when you do that, you do end up with this reaction. We can literally just add those half reactions together. Any questions? Okay. Now, uh, chemists have done this a lot with a lot of different sources of oxidation and reduction, or as a lot of times it's referred to, oxidizing agents and reducing agents. And they have cell potentials for a whole bunch of different things. Um, so a good table of reduction potentials is something you'll use in this section. Now reduction, of course, means that electrons are being gained. Gained electron reduce, part of the Leo the Lion says GER. So a good table will be a table of reductions, and they usually start most positive and go to most negative, and you can use them uh, really, really cool. And there's one in problem set five, of course, that I want you to use. Please don't use other tables because the values will be a little bit different if you go to Google. But of course, if you were away from Chem 223, nothing wrong with using Google too. You'll at least have an idea that that's happening. Now, before we talk about the table though, I want to talk about what you can do with the values you're going to see. And one of them I want to show you is that you can reverse any half reaction that you have, any reaction with electrons. And if you do it, you won't change the magnitude of E, but you will change the sign of E. Remember, E is the cell potential. It's measured in volts. All right, volts is kind of like a type of an energy. So here's an example. We saw earlier that zinc going to zinc 2 plus with two electrons when compared with she ended up with a cell potential of 0.76 volts. But in the table of reductions, which is what most tables are, we won't see them as oxidations. We're going to see them as reductions. So we're going to take reactants and products and flip them. And if you do it, it's no problem. You don't change the magnitude of the number, but you change the sign, all right? So a positive 0.76 volts becomes a negative 0.76 volts when you write this as a reduction, okay? So this one's an oxidation. Zinc has lost electrons. You flip it around. Zinc 2 plus is now gaining two electrons. This would be a reduction. And the table will have these kind of values in it but we can, as smart chemists, reverse them around and figure out what that cell potential is gonna be. So again, you're gonna see lots and lots of positive E values, but you're also gonna see a lot of negative E values. And negative E values just means that, well, they're probably not gonna be good at reducing, but they will be good at oxidizing, or they won't be very good uh, I always have to think about this. They won't be very good uh, oxidizing agents, but they will be good reducing agents. There you go. I have to think about that crazy translating thing too. So, Yeah, so here's the punchline. Negative E values are going to be great things to be oxidized, like this one right here. Zinc want, wants to lose electrons. On the other hand, some things like the copper 2 plus we saw earlier will have natural positive E values. They want to gain electrons. They're gonna be great oxidizing agents. So both the positives and the negatives have uses because remember in redox, something has to lose electrons and something has to gain electrons. That crazy yin yang thing all over again, so. All right, so that being said then, this is the table that's in problem set five and I just recreated it here. And like I said, a good table, I think, of this kind of stuff 
you'll have self potentials, then I think that they should start positive and go to most negative. Uh, you'll see them listed different ways. Sometimes they're listed by chemicals. I find that really frustrating because it's nice to know if something's gonna oxidize, reduce, whatever. Anyway, the middle part right here, that's the she electrode, all right? It's hard to see, it's late blue, but it's H plus going to H2, and that has a value of zero. So that literally could go both directions if it wants to, all right? And then everything above it with a positive E likes to gain electrons, all right? These are the ones that want to be reduced. They're good oxidizing agents. On the other hand, everything down below here with negative numbers, it doesn't mean that they're lame or something like that. It just means they would prefer to oxidize. They are better reducing agents, all right? So 0.763 on this one is zinc going to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons. That's what you can do. And uh, Having a positive number, we're going to see, means that the reaction will occur as listed. So all of these, if, they, if you give them electrons, they're good to go, all right? So for example, fluorine, we've seen since Chem 221, fluorine loves to be fluoride. Oh yeah, it does. The biggest of all the cell potentials, at least on this list anyway, it wants electrons more than anything else. It wants it more than hydrogen peroxide, which is super powerful. Um, gold three going to gold. That's actually interesting. That's so high. But anyway, I battle on. Uh, fluorine wants electrons really, really bad. That's why it has a positive. Now, if you look down the most negatives, these are the ones that want to be oxidized. They want to lose electrons. And guess what? Lithium, potassium, sodium, those group 1A metals that are really reactive with water, heck yeah, they want to get rid of their electrons. They prefer to be ions, all right? So it's kind of cool how it all comes together here in terms of these cell potentials. Uh, you'll never have to memorize any of these. It is helpful to know that she is zero, just as a reference point, but everything else, uh, you're good to go. Question. Now, <clears throat> boy, there's two ways if you're given a table to figure out the cell potential of something. And I'm going to show you the classic way, which is called the Northwest Southeast Rule. I don't like the Northwest Southeast rule. You can already tell that I've got issues with electrochemistry. I told you about the alternative way to balance redox reactions in base. I'm gonna tell you an alternative to the Northwest Southeast rule, but the classic way, all right, is that if you have these three chemicals, all right, any substance on the right will reduce any substance higher than it on the left, okay? So for example, zinc, gets along really well with copper two plus. The zinc will give up its electrons to copper two plus to make copper. The southeast and the northwest, if this was a map, all right, uh, make it possible. And that's why in a classic world, the table of redox potentials, more positive at the top, more negative at the bottom, all right? It's set up for this crazy northwest southeast rule. But that feels a little weird to me, all right? I've never totally gelled with this kind of thing. So if it says that it happens, which is what the Northwest Southeast rule means, it means that overall your cell potential is going to be a positive number. So it, what this Northwest Southeast rule is, it basically says flip the Southeast. So zinc becomes zinc two plus. And remember, if you flip a half reaction, negative becomes positive. So you'll get a positive 0.76, and you can add it with the northwest one as is. Positive 0.76 plus 0.34 would give you a positive cell potential. If we tried the northeast southwest, all right, if we wanted copper to make copper 2 plus, we would flip this number around and zinc two plus would still be zinc, well then we'd have a negative and a negative, and a negative cell potential isn't allowed. So the advantage of Northwest Southeast, I guess, is you don't have to think about positive and negative cell potentials. You just know that things in the Southeast will react with things in the Northwest. But that seems really weird to me. And you have to have a table of decreasing cell potential, stuff like that. So the way that works for me, all right, and you can use this with any table, is 
you just want to flip one reaction so that you have one that's being reduced and one that's being oxidized. And then you just add those cell potentials together. And this makes sense to me. Um, it, textbooks don't always have the table I showed you. So if you had a weird table with everything listed by the element, uh, honestly, of course I'm biased, right? I think that my method would work better. But anyway, you can decide this for yourself. So let's use my method to figure out the cell potential of this reaction, all right? And let's pretend we just look these things up. Well, if you look up on the table, all right, everything on the table is listed as a reduction, all right? So we'd see aluminum three plus going to aluminum with this value, and we'd see nickel two plus going to nickel. Remember, if you're a reduction, then electrons will be reactants. In Michael's method, quote unquote, you wanna make these half reactions look like this reaction. So you can see here in blue, the nickel two plus is a reactant as is. So we don't have to do anything here, but we want this reaction to look more like this one. And you can see that aluminum's on the opposite side. So what I would do in my method is I would flip this reaction around. If you do that, you change the sign of E. So negative becomes positive, all right? We don't have to do anything with this one right here. Now, if you multiply a half reaction by two, for example, and this half reaction by three to give you the overall cell potential, you don't change the individual values. And that's also important. So notice here that even though this reaction had two aluminums going to two aluminum three plus, you can write the two and the two there and make this six, but you don't change the sign of E. And that's a little weird. We'll talk about how the number of electrons changes in a future part. But for right now, just realize that you don't have to change this. So even though we multiplied this reaction by three to get this part right there, we didn't change any cell potentials. So let's back up for a second. If you are asked to find the cell potential of some random oxidized and reduced species and you have a table, A, if the table has most positive to most negative, then you can use the northwest southeast, all right? And the southeast corner will take on anything from the northwest, anything above it. But if you don't have that kind of table, all right, you want to find species that are similar. So aluminum to aluminum three plus is similar to this. Nickel two plus to nickel is exactly like that. You're going to flip one of the half reactions around. So the reduced part becomes oxidized. And just remember, if you do that, change the sign, all right? But finally, the last thing here, even if you multiply by two and three, don't change these numbers. They stay as is. Super prof hat on. I do recommend practicing just a little bit, all right? Because there's two methods, and sometimes it's confusing. And sometimes it'll say E cathode minus E anode, which I also don't like. That's Northwest Southeast talking, all right? I prefer that you just write out the half reactions, flip the one you need to, and add them together, all right? The flipping, the minus part of cathode minus anode comes naturally when you do it this way. So practice a little bit. Prof that back on. Battery is important. Yeah. <laughs> Any question? All right. So here's an example of what you could do if you had a random question. And you can do it either way you want. This question says calculate that E value, the E net value. So this just means figure out cathode and anode coming together, all right? A uh, little superscript means standard conditions, which is what these are, by the way. So here's a table, all right? It is from most positive going more negative as you go down. And we have here silver plus and silver at positive 0.8, copper two plus and copper at 0.337. So the two cell potentials are those listed right there. Now, we want copper metal and silver ions. Well, we got the silver ions, no problem, but hopefully you can see copper is not copper two plus. And again, I'm gonna highlight, include the charges, so important in this section. 
Copper versus copper 2 plus makes a big difference here. Copper is a solid, you can hold it in your hand. Copper 2 plus is a beautiful blue color in solution, but it is different than having copper. So we want copper, we're gonna have to flip the copper around, all right? It's going to be minus 0.337. We want the copper on the other side. Copper plus silver plus is what we're after, all right? So if you do that, minus 0.337 plus 0 0.80, positive 0.46 volts. Because this is a single electron transfer, we need to multiply it by two in order to get rid of the electrons. Remember in the overall reaction, you don't wanna show any electrons, but we don't do anything to the signs here, all right? Don't multiply this by two. So, let's say that Colton and I are in the lab messing around. We set this up, cadmium, cadmium plus two on one side, iron, iron plus two on the other side. And we have no idea what this reaction is gonna do. We do know that one side's going to be oxidized and the other side's gonna be reduced. But which is which? Will cadmium go to cadmium two plus and iron two plus go to iron or Will the cadmium 2 plus go to cadmium and the iron go to iron 2 plus? And this is what we need to figure out, all right? We set this up, what starts happening? Do we end up with less cadmium and more iron? Or do we end up with more cadmium and less iron? That's kind of the question we have here. Well, table of redox potentials to the rescue. We want to know which way this reaction is going to go. So if we look it up, iron plus two going to iron, cadmium plus two going to cadmium, both negative numbers, all right? So what that means is iron and cadmium both would prefer to lose electrons than gain electrons, all right? Which makes sense, metals usually want to lose electrons. But in this case, we're not gonna give them the choice. We wanna see what happens when they fit together, i.e. which one wants electrons more and which one wants to give up electrons more. Well, you can do it either way. You could do it northwest and southeast, all right? Which means that cadmium wants to go to cadmium two plus. You flip this around. You could also say iron two plus and wants to go to iron. So in that northwest, southeast, that's where you'll see this cathode minus anode stuff, which I honestly don't like, but that's okay. Uh, you would take the cathode, which is the minus 0 0.40, and subtract the anode, which is minus 0.44. So you can see it's minus 0.4, minus minus 0.44. It ends up to be positive 0 0.04. And why this is important, Positive E cells are the ones which are spontaneous. They're the ones that are going to occur. So if Colton and I would look at this, we would say, hey, cadmium is gonna make cadmium two plus, and the iron two plus will take those electrons to make iron. And we know that because positive E's are the ones that are gonna happen. Those are the spontaneous product favorite ones. And that would be an example of Northwest minus Southeast, whoops. Now, what I was gonna say there before I flipped it, sorry about that, is that in my method, Michael's method, all right, I would wanna combine these two half reactions to give an overall positive cell potential. So if you flip this one around, it would become positive 0 0.40, but positive 0 0.40 minus 0.44 still gives you a negative number. So that would not work, all right? That would help our system at all. So we want to flip this one. We want an overall cell potential to be positive, and if we would flip it and stuff, then uh, we would be good to go. Questions on that? Like I said, practice a little bit. Um, at the end of the day, working batteries, the ones that are spontaneous, the ones where something's gonna happen, are gonna have positive E cell values, all right? We'll talk about why that's the case here in a little bit. So here's another example. Iodide is something that will get, uh, give up electrons to become iodine. 
And if you take those electrons and you give it to water, you can actually make hydrogen gas and hydroxide ions. So the question here, can the iodide ion reduce water? All right, can iodide and water react to make iodine hydroxide and hydrogen gas? Now, this is kind of a cool question for me personally because when I've been out hiking and stuff like that, and you're in a place where the water isn't real good, you could add a source of iodide to purify the water, all right? And I've done this before, and the water tastes funky, but it certainly doesn't taste like base, which is just nasty, and I don't see bubbles coming off hydrogen. So I'm gonna hope here that the answer is no. Iodide doesn't reduce water. Hint, hint. I know the answer, of course. But anyway, uh, you, what you really want to do here is you want to see if this is going to happen. Well, we can do this using cell potentials. Here's the cell potential of this reaction. Here's the cell potential of this one. They're both, this is a reduction. This is oxidation. So the electrons cancel out. You add them together, minus 1.363 volts. So because this is a negative number, this reaction won't occur. And that's good. Every time I've been in the woods, I'm glad that my water is not being reduced by, um, by the iodide ion. Questions? Okay. Now, the negative E cell value means that reaction is not going to happen as is. It is non-spontaneous. So the opposite reaction, if you flip it around, you would get a positive 1.363 volts. So what this tells you is that if you add iodine and hydroxide and hydrogen gas together, you will get iodide and water, positive 1.363 volts. So the main reason I'm bringing this slide up is because I want you to see how positive E cells, they're the ones that are gonna happen. All right, those are the batteries that will work. On the other hand, if you have a negative E cell, those are not going to naturally go together. All right, nothing's gonna happen when that happens. Okay, so here's a question you might see. Will mercury reduce 10 to plus to 10? All right, and yes, no, more information is needed. And of course you could do it. Mercury liquid is, we're asking here if mercury liquid is going to react with 10 2 plus. Well, you can see that 10 2 plus is already a reactant, so we don't have to do anything here. But is mercury liquid, is it a reactant here? No. Mercury liquid is a product. So we want mercury liquid to be a reactant. What do we do to the sign of E if you flip it? Flip. Flip it, yeah, turn positive to negative, negative to positive. So to answer this question, we're gonna flip this reaction around, all right? And if you do that, you no longer have 0.79 positive, you've got negative 0.79. When you flip a reaction, you flip the sign. And a negative plus a negative becomes even more negative. So what that means, mercury liquid will not reduce 10 to plus. The negative sign says that reaction's not going to happen. If this would have been a positive number, we would have said yes. All right, we would have said, yeah, that will happen. So basically these kind of questions are saying, will the reaction occur, yes or no? All right, and the punchline is positive ease, yes. Negative ease like this one, no. Kaylin's like, oh, I kind of want to see iodide reduce water, <laughs> all right? So if you see a reaction and you really want it to occur, all right, can you make it happen? So iodide plus water, we saw it was a negative E, thumbs down. That reaction's not going to happen if you put the things together. Well, you can force reactions to occur in the opposite direction if you use external voltage. So remember when we talked about how basically what we're looking at is direct current batteries, all right? Things that go in a certain direction. Well, all the electrical outlets that you use, those are mostly AC, which means that electricity can go in both directions, but it is a source of voltage. 
So let's say that Kaylin really wants this reaction to happen, all right? If she would apply positive 1.363 volts to it, you can make this reaction go. And that's a really cool thing as a chemist, all right? So Kaylin adds 1.363 volts to this reaction. All of a sudden, iodide does start making, and water do start reacting. It'll make iodine, hydroxide, hydrogen gas. Electrolysis, in a chemistry perspective, is using electric current to make reactions happen that wouldn't usually happen. Electrolysis is not about taking off your body hair or anything. It's sorry, not that cool in chemistry. But anyway, in electrolysis, you're using electricity to make chemicals have, react that wouldn't normally happen. And this is super important for chemistry. Uh, sodium metal and chlorine gas and sodium hydroxide are made through electrolysis. A lot of these chemicals you wouldn't normally have access to or they'd be impure and stuff like that. Well, electrolysis, adding electricity, will make them happen, which is really cool. Now, it kind of feels like we're cheating here a little bit because we're going to see that negative E's are not second law of thermodynamics favored. The entropy of the universe, you would think, is not increasing. But the thing about that that makes it okay is that the way that we got the electricity from the outlet was still entropy favored. So we're basically taking an entropy favored product process and applying it to something which isn't entropy favored. We still, at the end of the day, are paying the entropy bill. It's just, you know, they say sometimes, you know, stealing from Paul to pay Peter or vice versa. I don't know. I, I don't know anything about it. Anyway, all right, prop that off, the separation of church and state. I don't know anything about it, but you're taking entropy from one product favorite thing and giving it to something which is not. And we're still end up paying the entropy of the universe bill. So, prop that back on again. If you see a cell potential that's negative, it's not a death sentence for a reaction. You can use external energy to make it happen. And in the Pacific Northwest here in Portland, the Reynolds aluminum plant, which was big for a long time, they had natural cheap electricity from Bonneville Dam that they could apply to make aluminum. And they made it for aircraft and aluminum cans and stuff like that. So, go science. Questions? So, Let's talk a little bit more about why E has to be positive in order for the reactions to go. And in order to do that, we're going to talk about Faraday. Now, Michael Faraday is actually one of the big electrochemists and uh, or electricity per people in general. And he's a really interesting kind of person uh, and it's interesting to hear about. It. But anyway, long story short, E is related to delta G. Now, we saw earlier that delta G's which are negative, those are the ones that are spontaneous, the ones that are going to happen. So delta G is related to E by delta G equals minus NFE. F is the last constant, I promise, I think. Yes, uh, yes it is, that I'm going to introduce to you. It's called the Faraday constant, 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. We'll see how this can be used here in a little bit. Coulombs is a measure of charge, all right? So F, every time you see that, 96,045 coulombs per mole, or 9.6485 times 10 to the fourth. That's what the F is. E is the cell potential. So in the last example, we saw a minus 1.36 number. That would go right in there. And N is the moles of electrons transfer. So if you have two moles of electrons being oxidized and then two moles being reduced, N would be two. We'll talk about this here coming up. This is a pretty important constant. In the old days, I had people memorize it. I would definitely put this on your sheet of things that you bring with you to quizzes and exams, because it'll be something that will pop up. Okay, so delta G equals minus NFE. We saw how delta G is less than zero if it's going to occur, if it's spontaneous. Well, if this is negative and there's a negative, that means that E is gonna be a positive number. So if you have a redox reaction, all right, E should be positive in order to be spontaneous because positive E means delta G is gonna be less than zero. 
On the other hand, if you have a reactant favorite condition, all right, then, oh, what is this? Faraday, go to hell, you terrorists. No, I'm just joking. Uh, seriously, Faraday, some people think Faraday was uh, not part of the elite of electrochemistry, but he's actually pretty cool. I think I have, yes, good, I have the X right there. Anyway, for reactant favorite conditions, E is a number that's less than zero, negative. Less than zero E means delta G is gonna be positive. So let me do my hand waving once again, all right? Delta S of the universe has to always increase for any process that's gonna happen. And positive delta S of the universe means negative delta G, all right? So that's what we use in chemistry most of the time, negative delta Gs. But if it's a redox reaction, what we're seeing here now is that negative delta Gs mean positive Es. So I apologize for all the hand waving and stuff, but it's the, just the way that these equations are set up. Any questions? Okay, so let's do an example that doesn't involve Faraday going to hell. This is an example of tin two plus and vanadium making tin and vanadium two plus, positive E, okay? If E is positive, does that mean this reaction is going to occur or not? Yeah, it's gonna occur. Good, Clifford, you're on it. Positive E means the reaction is gonna occur. If you have a positive E and there's a negative right there, what's gonna be the sign of delta G? Negative. Negative, that's right. Remember, negative delta Gs and positive Es go together, okay? So right away, A, B, and C flat out, ignore them, all right? It's going to be one of these two. Now, if you want to do the math with me, it's cool. You can put this voltage in directly for here. F is that 96,045 number. N is the moles of electrons transferred. If you look at 10 2 plus going to 10, how many electrons would you have to add to 10 2 plus to make it neutral 10? Two, yeah, well done. So in this example, t the N number is two. There's two electrons transferred. You could have done it from vanadium's perspective too, because vanadium has lost two electrons to become vanadium two plus. So that's how you get the moles of electrons transferred. Any questions on that? One more thing, the number that comes out here is a big number, all right? And that's because initially delta G comes out to be joules. So a lot of times delta Gs, as well as delta Hs, are listed as kilojoules. So remember that to go from joules to kilojoules, you divide by a thousand. So in this case, if you divide all of this by a thousand, you'll get the kilojoules. I'm, I'm glad I saw you there doing that, Stephanie, because I'm like, oh yeah, I should talk about jewels to kill a jewel. so uh, thank you for, you're on it. Other questions? Okay. Now, there's some cool things you can do with all this jazz, because let's say that you uh, really want to make silver metal from silver ions, and if the price of silver metal is high enough, there's some kind of cool things you can do with it. Um, so in this case, we're making silver plus into silver, and for every mole of silver plus that we react, we need a mole of electrons. So notice here that we need a mole of electrons to make a mole of silver metal. That's because silver plus needs it, all right? So the way to measure how many moles of electrons you're using, we're going to use something called amps. Now, we're kind of touching physics here just for a touch, but it's not going to be hardcore or anything. Um, current is how people measure the electrons, if you will. And current usually gets the symbol I in physics. So current equals the coulombs per second that are going by, all right? So if you have just a little bit of electricity, you only have a few coulombs going by per second. But on the other hand, if you have a lot of current, then you have a big number of coulombs going by each second. For you in Chem 223, an amp equals a coulomb per second. So here's an example of that. We have a current, 1.50 amps. Stop right there. You can just cross the amps out and put in coulombs per second. It's gonna make your units make more sense that way, all right? Anyway, coulombs per second. 
and it's flowing through silver plus for 15 minutes. And the question is, how much silver metal is deposited? So we want at the end the grams or kilograms, something like that, of silver, okay? Now, all of these questions either start with time and go to amount, grams, or they start with amount, grams, and they go to time, all right? So in this problem, we're starting with time and we're gonna go to amount. So what I would do is, first of all, we got minutes and we got seconds. So we've gotta make the units the same. And there are 60 seconds in a minute, so we can take 15 minutes, multiply it by 60 to get the seconds. And then this amp, again, is a coulomb per second. So at the end here, we're gonna have how many coulombs of charge were transferred over. So we just took the time and multiplied it by the amps, essentially, to get the coulombs. And if you remember, the Faraday constant was coulombs per mole of electrons, 96,045 coulombs per electrons. So you can see here how the coulombs are gonna just cancel out, and now we've got so many moles of electrons. And finally, because it's silver plus going to silver, we need one mole of electrons to make one mole of silver plus become one mole of silver. So the moles of electrons one mole of electron is needed to make one mole of silver metal. That comes out to this many moles. If you multiply by the molar mass of silver, 107.8, 107.9 or so, 107.8, that's gonna give you the, the grams of silver that you've got. So in these problems, all right, time, well, I just should, didn't show on the last slide, time to coulombs, because coulomb amps is a coulomb per second. So times time times amps will give you coulombs. Coulombs divided by Faraday gives you moles of electrons and moles of electrons into quantity. The other kind of problem you'll see is a problem like this, all right? So let's say, uh, Jenna and I say, hey, let's go out in the desert and look for fossils, I don't know. But Jenna knows that I'm a weird chemist and I've got my own homemade battery. Oh, okay, my homemade battery is apparently gonna deliver 1.50 amps. And Jenna finds out that in my battery, I have 454 grams of lead. And she wants to know, justifiably so, how long our battery's gonna last because you don't wanna get stuck in the desert with a dead battery stupid example, but this is an example of the opposite process. We're going to start with quantity and we want to go to time, all right? So in this problem, 454 grams, we need to turn into moles. And if you look up here, this is a lead 2 plus. Sulfate is a negative 2, so lead is a positive 2 in this case. This is a two electron transfer to go from lead to lead two plus. You can also see that, of course, because this is this half reaction, it shows two electrons, but it's two electrons here being transferred. So for every mole of lead, we're gonna get two electrons transferred out of it. So we'll have a total of 4.38 moles of electrons. Any questions so far? Good. Now, from moles of electrons, that's where the Faraday constant comes in. 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. So if you multiply this number by the moles of electrons that we have, this is the amount of coulombs we're gonna actually have. And the, and the battery that we're using needs 1.50 coulombs per second. So if you take this coulombs and the 1.50 coulombs per second, remembering again that amp is nothing more than a coulomb per second, then you're gonna end up with the coulombs divided by coulombs per second. The number comes out to be so many seconds, 282,000 seconds. And if you go from seconds to minutes, minutes to hours, about 78.3 hours, all right? So this battery should last 78.3. But of course, if Jenna was smart, no more than 48 hours, and it's time to go back because you never know when your calculations blah, blah, blah. Hey, questions on? Yeah. Um, 
This is just an example of a problem. Uh, this one says we've got a gold plating. We're taking gold plus three into gold metal. How long, i.e. time, will it take to take 0 0.0100 moles of gold three plus using 2.0 amps? So the process you'd use here, start with the moles of gold. We're taking gold plus three to gold zero. That's a three electron transfer. That'll give you to moles of electrons. Moles of electrons divided by Faraday will give you the coulombs. And this 2.00 amps means 2.00 coulombs per second. So if you do all this around, it comes out to be 1,450 seconds. And what this tells you is that after that amount of time, you will have 0 0.0100 moles of pure gold. All right? And that might be really cool because gold, of course, is expensive, blah, blah, blah. Any questions? Okay. Uh, the very last piece of stuff we're going to do on Friday is the Nernst equation. There's, I think, one problem from problem set five, but everything else from problem set five, you'll have good to go after going through this section. So we're getting there. All right. All right. Looking forward to seeing you in lab either today or Friday. Have a wonderful day.